I am very pleased uh, to introduce to you all Lydia Molin. Lydia is an associate professor of philosophy. She earned her PhD in philosophy from Boston University. Her research focuses on applying the history of philosophy and the work of the philosopher G.W.F. Hegel to contemporary philosophical debates. Her book, Hegel on Political Identity, Patriotism, Nationality, Cosmopolitanism, considers the value of patriotism in ethical life. She was the coordinator of Colby's 2012-13 annual humanities theme, Comedy, Seriously. It's my honor to turn this over to Lydia Molin. Thank you, Laurie, and thank you to all of you for being here. Welcome especially to President Green. It's an honor for me to be speaking here today. Um, so as Laurie just said, my philosophical home uh, is in a period of philosophy known as German idealism, which was roughly between 1790 and 1810, and I tend to work on the most famous representative of that period, uh, G.W.F. Hegel, whose very serious philosophical face you can join me in enjoying here. <laughs> Um, and as Laurie said, my first book was on Hegel's political philosophy, but in more recent years I've been thinking more about Hegel's philosophy of art. Um, most of my research time is spent very quietly in a room, alone, with books, thinking deep thoughts. Um, and most of my teaching time is spent in a room with students, very quietly, thinking very deep philosophical thoughts. And I can't, I can't overestimate how important that focused core is to everything that I do. But today I want to talk a little bit about how being at Colby in particular, how people and resources at Colby have expanded and enriched my research and teaching in perhaps unexpected ways. So when I first came to Colby, I was working on the last chapter of my book, um, and I wanted to find ways to apply Hegel's political philosophy to contemporary cosmopolitanism in political thought. Cosmopolitanism is just the philosophical claim that we have ethical obligations not just to people in our immediate area, but to people around the world. And I, so I wanted to develop a course uh, at Colby that would help me explore some of this literature with students. So I developed a course called Philosophical Approaches to Global Justice in which we read thinkers such as Martha Nussbaum, Peter Singer, and Thomas Poga all of whom have very well thought out philosophical theories about justice that they then apply to very concrete issues. So um, as I was working on this uh, course, I had two other goals that I wanted uh, to work on, and I turned to the wonderful Alice Elliott, who's associate director of the Goldfarb Center, to help me with both of these aspects of this course. The first was that since um, we were studying people who had applied their philosophical theories to concrete issues, I wanted to give students a chance to do that as well. So together with Alice, I developed a civic engagement component to this course, which means that students can go out into the community, engage in volunteer organizations, um, do civic engagement projects that also are consciousness raising. And that's been a very exciting way of having students go out into the community, do research, and bring that research back into the classroom um, and enrich that conversation in very um, exciting ways. Um, but the other uh, thing that I wanted to work on that Alice also helped me with is I wanted to be very careful in this course not to give the impression that issues of global injustice happen only in other parts of the world. I wanted to make really clear that we also often per participate in and sometimes perpetuate um, global injustice. So I was new to Maine and I asked Alice if she had any ideas about the best way to talk about that more locally. And she suggested that I look into um, studying the Wabanaki, which are a Native American confederacy based um, in Maine, also north into Canada. Um, there have been Wabanaki in this part of the world for at least 12,000 years. They have a very long tradition of self-governance, language, traditions, cultures. Um, but as was the case for many Native American tribes, contact with European settlers for them was uh, disastrous. One statistic I saw recently was that between the years 1616 and 1619, between uh, displacement, disease, and warfare, 90% of Wabanaki um, died. 
So there were originally 20 tribes in the Wabanaki Confederacy. Um, there are now four whose emblems you see on this slide here, uh, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, and the Maliseet. Over the next several centuries after that uh, trauma, uh, these tribes also uh, had land taken away from them and suffered centuries of um, discrimination and uh, loss of land and other um, traumatic things. So, um, Unfortunately, the effects of this national trauma um, continue to be obvious in the Wabanaki community, which suffers from unemployment and mortality and poverty rates much above the national average. And I want to read to you a brief passage from the website of an organization called Maine Wabanaki Reach, uh, which is a wonderful resource for understanding these issues. And I have it here for you to see as well. Historical trauma, also known as intergenerational trauma, is defined as increasing emotional and psychological wounding across generations that stems from massive group trauma. The massive group trauma experienced by Native people has occurred across generations, beginning with the taking of their land, lives through murder, bounties, war, and disease, children through residential schools, adoption and foster care, language, spiritual practices, and impoverishment. The taking of Native people's traditional ways of dealing with grief compounds the impact of trauma by undermining their capacities to care for one another and to promote healing from these harms. I always tell students on the first day of class that this is not going to be a cheerful class. Um, and you can see some of that um, playing out in this, I think, very um, beautifully crafted statement. But this example sets up one of the key questions in the course, Philosophical Approaches to Global Justice, namely the question of nationhood and collective responsibility. So collective responsibility is just a term that philosophers use um, to discuss the phenomena or ask the question of whether if I am part of a rampaging mob um, and I do not actually throw the stone through the window but someone does, am I nevertheless in part responsible for the window? Of course, this is a very controversial question, but most philosophers concede that there is such a thing, in some cases anyway, as collective responsibility. So the next question um, is whether there is such a thing as national collective responsibility. In other words, um, are we collectively responsible for our nation's actions? Um, and one of the philosophers that we read in this class is named David Miller, um, who in a book called National Responsibility and Global Justice suggests that there are two conditions which, if met, mean the nation is collectively responsible for the consequence in question. The first is that the nation be democratically ruled, and the second is more nebulous. Namely, we are responsible for our nation's actions when the actions flow from the national culture. So one of the questions we need to answer as regards our collective responsibility for the fate of the Wabanaki is whether the actions taken against them flowed from national culture. So we spend a lot of time in this class just talking about what national culture might mean and uh, try to answer the question how that might help us understand collective responsibility. And here, uh, believe it or not, is where my new interest in Hegel surprisingly uh, emerged. Um, because I decided, decided then to teach another course at Colby on the philosophy of art, through which I could learn more about the philosophy of art um, in order to interpret Hegel more uh, effectively. So in 2013, I taught this course, Philosophy and Art, as a museum lab course sponsored by the Center for Arts and Humanities. And in thinking about that, and especially in benefiting uh, from the expertise of the amazing Lauren Lessing, who is one of our curators in the museum, I started to think about the following question. What can art tell us about national culture and so about collective responsibility? And thanks to a tour that I took with Lauren, I learned that Colby owns several artworks that depict Native Americans in ways that might be able to help us answer this question about collective responsibility. So I want briefly to show you two of them. The first object is a bronze sculpture by Henry Kirk Brown from 1849 entitled Choosing of the Arrow. The sculpture depicts a young native warrior about, as promised, uh, to choose an arrow for his hunt. So that's easy enough. Um, but through Lauren's help, I started to think about this piece differently. As part of his training to make this piece, Brown went to study Native Americans in Michigan. But what he produced when back in the studio looks very little like, what, like the Native Americans that he had seen. 
Instead, what comes through is Brown's neoclassical training, obvious if we compare his sculpture to the one on your right, <laughs> a depiction of Apollo by the Florentine artist Pietro Francavilla in 1591. So why would Brown, who had seen and studied Native Americans, choose to depict this young Indian warrior as a Greek god? I mean, just the hips are going in the other direction, but otherwise, it's, it's pretty close. So the answer it has, I think, to do with two conflicting impulses at work in the formation of American national culture. The first has to do with the national search for roots, for something, that, something ancient in our history that would give us some dignity in the eyes of the more established European nations. To this end, Native Americans were frequently described as our Greeks and Romans, a culture with a rich, noble history that we could then claim as our own. The second was to show that unlike corrupted, decadent Europeans, our native man was pure, close to nature, uncorrupted by society, in the same way that America was pure and uncorrupted by European degeneracy. So you can see uh, the closeness, closeness to nature here as well. He's facing whatever threat uh, he's confronted with uh, nude and with only an arrow to defend himself. This was also one of the first nude sculptures that was um, exhibited in the United States. There were reports of people fainting. Um, I do recommend that you go and see this in the museum here at Colby, but please don't faint. Uh, please stay calm. Uh, so images of Native Americans allowed the United States as an emerging nation to claim both enduring cultural heritage, so our Greeks and Romans, and our freedom from the corruption of culture. But both of these descriptions, uh, while in the face of them complementary to Native Americans as having a long distinguished history and as strong and close to nature, also encouraged American audiences to believe that Native American culture was over. Just like the Greeks and Romans had faded, so too must Native Americans fade. And as much as Native Americans' closeness to nature was to be admired, it also allowed them to be dismissed as primitive savages whose only reasonable course of action was to capitulate to American technology and modernization. And so we come to the second object um, from our collection that I want to show you. This is a 1918 bronze version of The End of the Trail by James Fraser. Fraser made the original 1915 sculpture, which is 17 feet by 14 feet. It's enormous for exhibition at the 1915 World's Fair in San Francisco. It stood at the entrance to the entire fair where an estimated 19 million people saw it. The 1915 World's Fair was among other things meant to affirm the West Coast as part of the United States. And in order to claim territory as your own, it's necessary that other nations are not living there. Fraser himself said, quote, as a boy, I remembered an old Dakota trapper saying, the Indians will someday be pushed into the Pacific Ocean. The title of the end of the trail clearly references Fraser's assessment that this point had been reached. Now, Fraser's own attitudes towards Native Americans were, in fact, very complex. This was not meant to be a celebratory sculpture, believe it or not. But there's no doubt that many visitors to the World's Fair would have read this as a commentary on the extinction of Native Americans as a natural, justified passing of a civilization in the face of a new nation's birth. So the case for collective responsibility is very complex, and I've only given part of it here. Um, but sadly, I think there's no question that the injustices that, that Wabanaki are still suffering um, can be described as flowing from American national culture. And I think that art can help us see that. But once we've established a case of collective responsibility, the next question can be just as difficult to answer. And we do love difficult questions in philosophy. So how can cases of collective responsibility be rectified? And here again, the Wabanaki um, provide wonderful case studies. The first one, um, one way to address cases of collective responsibility is through the law. And in fact, in 1980, some tribes within the Wabanaki Confederacy won what is still the largest land claim settlement against the United States federal government for breaking its own laws in the purchasing of Native American land. So here you see Carter signing um, this settlement. I won't say more about that here, but it's incredibly interesting and complex um, and something that I think we should all know more about. 
But there's also an extremely interesting attempt to address historical injustices that is going on within the Wabanaki community right now. Native American children all over the United States underwent forced assimilation. They were often forcibly removed from their homes and sent to boarding schools where they were forbidden to practice their own culture in an explicit attempt to kill the Indian and save the man, as it was often put. And the practice of removing Wabanaki children from their homes as part of forced assimilation persisted in Maine into the 1950s under the supervision of the Maine Office of Child and Family Services. So in 2011, groups concerned to address the harm perpetuated by these practices convened the Maine Wabanaki State Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, modeled on the one used in post-apartheid South Africa. So the commission is hearing cases of people, now adults, who are affected by these forced displacements, allowing them to tell the truth about their experience. Uh, like the TRC in South Africa, this, co this commission is controversial. Um, but people involved in it are convinced that hearing these stories can help us um, understand and redress these injustices. And the fact that this is taking place in Maine in 2014 provides another fantastic opportunity for me and my students to witness a community reacting in real time to the kinds of philosophical issues raised in this course. Thank you very much. I'm sitting next to Dean Kasman, which is uh, appropriate for this question, which, yes. uh, L Lydia, as you know, uh, for a number of years, Colby students have been involved in a variety of efforts to connect uh, to the Wabanaki community in Maine. And uh, I think some of those efforts have been uh, risk the, some of the concerns that Professor Bestiman talked about in terms of coming in and trying to sort of save the yes. natives. But I'm just curious about your sense or your perspective on what might be useful ways for Colby students to, to continue that involvement in a way that um, you know, is, makes sense given your work. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's my plan for next semester when I teach this course again. I want us to go and listen. I just think uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to go and hear a community describing its own needs in its own terms, um, but also in a framework that should, to my students, be familiar. Um, when you read philosophical theories about cosmopolitanism and global justice, one of the things that will come up as a form of restitution is just the willingness to sit and listen and to acknowledge what happened. And that seems so little, right? And that's part of why the TRC in South Africa was controversial, because lots of people would say, you can't tell me that that kind of injustice can be perpetuated and then addressed just by hearing what happened. There must be more that needs to be done. And there is more that needs to be done. Um, but I do think we can start there. And I think, back to Catherine's talk, um, we always need to do that in a spirit of humility and of learning and not thinking that we now, finally, after all of these centuries, know how to help. So thank you for that question. This is a comment. It came in via Twitter from Chris Miranda, class of 09. I knew Chris was going to write. <laughs> <laughs> He's watching from somewhere. He says, I just wanted to say that I'm deep, deeply grateful for Lydia teaching me patience in Global Justice 09. Well, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I, I, I will say, too, that I, I had the great good fortune of hearing uh, not only from Chris, but from two other students specifically about this course recently, one who um, has been teaching in inner city schools in Detroit and uh, one who is d working with immigrants in Lewiston, actually, um, both talking about how ideas um, of this sort play an important role in their understanding of what they're doing. So thank you to all of them for getting back in touch with us and telling us how um, some, th some of the things that we teach can have an effect. That's very... Very rewarding. I'm interested in um, knowing a little bit more about how you found your way to Hegel. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good, that, that is actually a good story. Um, 
I was a German exchange student uh, from a very modest suburban Seattle high school in 1990. And uh, as you all know, 1990 was right after the wall had come down. Um, so I found myself completely out of dumb luck, uh, a witness to one of the major world historical moments um, of my generation. And also completely fascinated by the political dimensions of that. So what did it mean to be a state? What did it mean to be a nation? What did it mean that you used to be a nation, and then you were divided, and now you were back together again? Um, and those questions just lit up my mind. And so when I went to college, I knew I wanted to do political science. But then I got hooked on the deeper questions. Sorry to my uh, colleagues in political science. Um, got hooked on the deeper questions. And because I had that facility in language from my time in uh, Germany as an exchange student that gave me the, uh, the linguistic cap capabilities to pursue this uh, line of inquiry. Um, so I have fabulous teachers in my background to thank for that. I just wanted to thank you for the way you started uh, relative to the rest of your talk because you started out by saying a lot of your time is spent thinking, looking at books, pondering, <laughs> contemplating, and so on. And then there is this out into the world component. But I wonder if you could talk more about the interplay between those two things because, of course, we love it when our students go out and do research and are engaged <coughs> in the world and, and so on. But we want them to come back to the classroom, too. Yeah. Um, so if you could talk about that. Yeah, thank bit. you. And it, I think in a way that connects back to Mark's original question, which is that we don't want to be sending our students into the world um, without their having thought very carefully about the history and the theory and all of the complexities that go into these things that we want them to experience, but we want them to experience them from a place of knowledge. And, and again, as I think uh, a couple of us have said, we want that knowledge to have engendered some humility as well as adventurousness. So um, that combination of being willing to go out there uh, and think carefully about things from other people's perspective and always knowing that you want to go back to the classroom, whether that classroom is physically at a college or just in your mind, um, such that you're always checking back with um, not just your energy to help things, but your, uh, the theory and the uh, knowledge base from which you do that. Um, and I think that's really important for us as teachers as well. Um, we can sometimes get caught up in always trying to figure out how to present these things um, to students, but it's really important for us to have the time to think through the deeper complexities as a form of grounding our own work. 